This is Agorist Nexus Podcast. I'm Brandon. I've got my great co-host, Dag, with me. How you doing, Dag? I'm doing pretty excellent, man. How you doing? Pretty good. Make sure you guys give Dag a follow on Twitter, at Dagorist, D-A-G-O-R-I-S-T. Uh, great follow, by the way. I think float, all that other stuff, same handle. <laughs> yeah, float. Make sure you follow him on float. I'm uh, super excited for our guest tonight. We have a very special guest. Uh, before we get to that, though, let me give a shout out to our sponsor, Presearch. Check them out at presearch.org, or you can hit them up through our site, agorasnexus.com slash search. Really spectacular search engine, y'all. No spying, no censorship. They have a really cool crypto coin that you can earn just by using the search engine. Uh, really cool guys. They have a really great project going on over there, and they have been helping out us, helping us out quite a bit, too. So make sure you check them out. Yeah, for sure. And I really like I really like the uh, pre-search search engine because I could just seamlessly change to DuckDuckGo or or any other search engine on there. Like you could do Google too, but I don't I don't recommend that. That they have the uh, Coin Market Cap and Coin Gecko and stuff like that is a, a search button on there too. It makes it yeah if you're yeah coins. like Ether Scan and for sure yeah. With that said, we've got the great Lily Forrester, huge agorist as you guys know, and. She's doing all kinds of cool stuff right now. She just released a book. So we wanted to have her on and talk about all the different things that she's doing. With that said, how are you doing, Lily? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So I guess a bunch of people want to know, like, especially with what happened a couple of years back, like, how is how is Lily Forrester today? Surprisingly well. Like, you know, I expected things to be a lot harder, but... In like a couple of days on the first, it'll be two years since the murder. And I can't say I'm doing bad. And like life just continues to improve. And there are just more things coming that are improving. Like I might not even be on the run for much longer. Who knows? (laughs) Nice. Yeah, that's that's a good thing. Yeah, it's great to see like that things are improving and, and things are getting better and and that you don't have to worry as much and you know and it really shows like all the hard work that you've put in to to make your life better i yeah i had a bit of an uphill battle for several reasons like a lot of people really love john golden but a lot of people also really didn't love john golden you know he was he was difficult and he also you know he was it i i won't say he controlled my facebook because like he just he used it as his own Facebook because he was too lazy to make his own for like years. And as a result, most people thought of me as a confrontational little shit. <laughs> and so like I found after the murder, I kept trying to get people to hire me and I kept finding people were resistant. I couldn't figure out why. Like, you know, all I had done is work my ass off. And then it like occurred to me, like and a few people told me, like, yeah, we thought you would be more difficult to work with than you are. And it's like, well, that was an uphill battle, you know, and, but I just, I was so motivated by living in Mexico and the fact that despite everything, you know, I hadn't been deported from Mexico and I'm still fucking here that like, that's what carried me to happiness. Also, I decided I was going to be happy in spite of everything because I was tired of being depressed. (laughs) I hate to say that it's that easy, but sometimes that's a big part of it is making the decision that you're going to you know well, well like it, you're the, gonna be the, happy. Hard, <laughs> the hard part about the de- making the decision to be happy is the fact that you have to make it every day and like there's still some days where i wake up and i just want to break things you know but like i just have to remind myself like look you know you live in a beautiful place for very cheap you i i don't work a job that i hate i don't work for anybody that i dislike you know like I don't have money troubles at this point because now I've built up a reputation for myself and my freelancing where people are willing to just give me a shot. And generally they're pleasantly surprised by what I I bring to the table. So now life's just fun. And it's like, part of me is like, why didn't I get to something like this sooner? But I guess as the hippies say, yeah, the the universe makes it happen when it's going to happen. I guess, I guess I had to go through a bunch of bad shit to really be able to appreciate all the good (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's something that i say quite a bit is to you know to find the light and to appreciate the light you you've got to experience the darkness um and it's kind of crazy how that works but so i guess another question that um 
that one of my friends asked me was like, man, Willie's like off doing her own thing in Mexico. Like she's doing all these like, you know, freelance jobs. Like I, I really want to do that. And so I guess, I guess my first question is, is like, how can somebody, how can somebody be like a digital nomad? Like w- what kind of advice would you have for them? Um, this is something I've been like, I've, I'm getting into consulting of this because I've been consulting people like personally for free in my life, trying to just help them, you know, be more free. My boyfriend being one of them, like my first bit of advice is to like play into your skills. And like, that might be as simple as like, if you were good at filling out homework, at school, you're going to be good at like assist online virtual assistant work. I was great at that shit. And I love doing virtual assistant work as a result, you know, but my boyfriend, he's different. You know, he speaks Spanish and English and he's also got like a very teacher like personality to him. So he's, he's gotten into giving Spanish and English classes for, you know, to whoever will do it online. And I, I, that's my biggest advice. Like if you like to talk, get into voice, voice recording. There's a lot of money in that. If you have a good voice, if you don't like to deal with people, but you like to make money, you know, get into WordPress work. WordPress work is like, I have self taught myself everything, but like I'm to the point where I'm getting paid to work on websites for people. Whereas it was just like me trying to figure out my own website to begin with play into your interests if you like reading or if you like listening to things like there's jobs for that you know if you like writing you know find out what it is that sounds most appealing if you like art graphic design is a lot of fun like I have been really upping my game with graphic design recently I have a touch screen so that helps so I'm like sitting there smearing my finger across my touch screen on an image way zoomed in but like that's that's what I find fun. That's what I find exciting. Like I have friends that, you know, they sit at home and they like I'm going to get one of my friends writing for the homestead guru because she sits at home making all this awesome food from scratch. And it's like, OK, well, start sharing about it. If you like making food, make money that way. You just kind of got to try things. You know, that's another thing. It's like I literally I'm still this way. Like I won't turn down any jobs. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Like I've tried everything from social media management to to transcription, to podcast editing and graphic design and podcast hosting. And like, I've tried it all. And some of it, I like more doing more than others. And, you know, you just kind of go with what you like that makes you the most money. I I like it. And, you know, it's one thing that really gets me in this this is something that I wasn't, you know, I, 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 I've recently been getting better at. And it's like, man, like you just got to fucking like do it sometimes. You know what I mean? Like there's always an excuse. There's always a reason not to do something, you know, it's very, well, I can't do it because of this or because of that and making excuses. It's like, man, sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta do it. Sometimes you just gotta learn along the way, you know? Um, But, but, you know, like you were saying, if there's something that, you know, you have to do for yourself, like if you have to build a website for yourself, you know, Hey, you're picking up a skill there, you know? Yeah. You might not want to be like professional, website designer forever but hey you can do a site or two on the side or help out a friend or something like that you know there there's some potential there and like and there's, there's all different see what sticks there's all different angles too because like if you get into wordpress stuff but you prefer writing you could just like learn how to do things on wordpress and make hella money either writing or making videos showing people how to do these things on wordpress Yes, that's, and that's, a, that's an excellent point. Just any that, skill you do have, just record it and put it on YouTube. Or, you know, yeah, whatever. that's something I plan to get into in the future because I've been looking it up and WordPress writers, like tutorial writers make a lot of money. And I, I love writing shit like that. So it's like, yeah, you just you just try everything and see what is easy for you and see what's hard for you. You know, like, like my boyfriend, he, he's great at the English classes. He's kind of slow and not so great at, English transcribing because English is a second language, you know? So it's right. like sometimes he misses the nuances of certain details in conversation, which he gets the gist, but sometimes people talk weird in transcriptions too. And it's just like, what in the fuck did they say? Like, even I have that problem. I do transcriptions regularly. I do some for TDV. And like, sometimes I like 
have to listen to it like seven or eight times to figure out what the fuck the person's trying to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just throw shit at the wall, see what sticks and go with it. And don't be afraid to evolve because that's the one thing. If you're going to work from home, you're going to most likely end up having like 10 or more income streams or a lot of anxiety <laughs> or <Yeah>. both <laughs> if you're me. <laughs> I feel like I'm falling into that where I'm like, well, you know, like, like me and my wife are like, well, within a few years, we want to be able to work, you know, get all our income from, you know, our property here one way or another. But it's like, yeah, I feel like we're each going to have 10 different things, you know, that it's going to be 10 different items or, or businesses or whatever that we're going to get a little bit from each and make it enough to make it work. You know, I, I just feel like that's going to be the case there, you know, but it's, exactly. also when, when we've got the farms. What's so like, well, you know, make, you know, a little bit of jam from this item and we make the dog treats from chicken feet. So it's just like, we just have so many different things and like uh, things that would just be waste unless we find a way to use it, you know? So it's a, uh, you know, it just takes a little bit of creativity and just adding a thing at a time, I think. Yep. I agree completely. And yeah, like that's, that's another piece of advice is like start one thing at a time. Cause like, it's really easy to like, like when I first dove into the world of freelancing and I was like, Oh, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. And then it's like, how do you focus? You know, but like, you just start looking for opportunities and the things that seem most appealing first, try them one at a time, you know, like one thing I recommend people not do is take on like, for example, like I have a virtual assistant job where I make a certain amount every month and I have like a list of things that I have to do five days out of the week. And if you take on too many of those without giving yourself time to get acclimated to them, like let's say you find two of them at the same time and you start them both at the same time, you're going to end up overloaded because like even starting one of those jobs, like the first week or two is always going to be an adjustment period. Like you know, the, your client telling you how they want things and like editing, you know, like when I started working for a beautiful thought, it was like, we had like several days coming up with like how we're going to do all the images. And, you know, he would, he'd have to critique me. Oh, you forgot to do this part of the, you know, thing. You forgot to change this detail, et cetera, et cetera. And like, so it takes like a couple weeks where the work is like, it takes like so much longer. And I think that's where a lot of people get discouraged as they get into this stuff. And the first two or three times they do these jobs, they take forever. And they're like, oh my God, I'm not going to make any good money. But after you start doing those things for about a month, like it goes a lot faster. You know, when I started that A Beautiful Thought job, it took me like three hours a day to do everything. Now it takes me 40 minutes. And that includes transcribing a five to 12 minute podcast. So. Do you'd mentioned a beautiful thought. Do you want to tell us what that is? Yeah, it's, um, it's, I call it the masterpiece of Kurt David Robinson. Um, Kurt David Robinson is like a, he's like a, I don't know how to say it. he was one of the original people at Anarchapulco and he was there the first year that I was there. He has like this rap and it's about running away to Anarchapulco with Bitcoin. <laughs> and we used to listen to it all the time, but he got deported about three years ago from Mexico. Um, he was just on a bus and he got caught by immigration. <clears throat> he had over, he had only overstayed his visa. So they deported him and shipped him back to Australia. And instead he like, after getting back to Australia, he traveled to like India and Portugal and all these places and pursued what he like refers to as like the science of happiness. He's trying to figure out like practical routes to help people get to happiness without having to get extra shit, you know, or go places. So the podcast is him like Monday through Friday, more Monday through Thursday, he does like a little monologue, but it's like, you can just kind of hear the happiness ooze out of him, you know? You you can tell he's qualified to be talking about happiness, and you can hear it with the way he talks about things. And he comes up with, like, these little practical anecdotes, or he shares stories from his past and how he's dealt with everything from, like, those memories, you know, like, those memories that you, you remember, like, 12 years later, and you just kind of cringe about it. And he oh, tells yes. you how to deal yeah, with shit, day. like... 
Yeah, exactly. He tells you how to deal with stuff like that and how to deal with, you know, bad news and how to all sorts of stuff. Like it's, it's super useful. And then on Fridays, most of the time there are interviews. He interviewed me for that podcast, but it's basically like anybody who has been through a whole bunch of shit and come out happy. So it, it's like, when I first started working for him, it was like, I, I was interested in it. But like, once I actually started working on the project and listening to what he was saying and how he was saying things, like, I appreciate it. He talks a lot about spiritualism and a lot about travel and psychedelics. But he's always very like quick to say, you know, you can reach this state of happiness without doing any of this stuff that I have done just by following the advice from the lessons I learned from doing these things. So it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Like it's at beautifulpodcast.com and we post things like Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. And it's, it's been a great project to work for. And he's a great boss. Did you too, say, like, did you say a beautifulpodcast.com? It's, it's beautiful podcast. No, a beautiful. Okay. Um, I'm going to check that out. You know, I, um, for years, I was just, you know, seven hours a day of, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, political or, you know, libertarian or whatever podcast, you know. Same um, here. And just eating it up <laughs> and loving it. And it's like, but like these last, and I don't know if it's just because everything that's been going on this last year, I'm just tired. Or if it's, you know, be, I've been working a lot recently or something, but like these last couple of months, man, it's been comedy podcasts. I just, I haven't been able to, it's, I haven't been wanting to do that to my brain. You know what I mean? I've been trying to keep it light and keep it easy so something like that's probably a good thing for me to check out because that sounds like the kind of thing that I could go for right about now yeah he's uh, he's like it's I I appreciate him because like he's not cheesy about it but he like Mm -hmm. you listen to the podcast and you just feel good after you know like I, I I just appreciate him a lot and he's also a great boss like when I fucking broke my computer by spilling water on it he was very patient working with me like, oh, this thing happened, this kind of things happened, no worries, you know, get it fixed. And I was still managing to do my work. It was just taking me longer to do it. And he's just a great boss to have, you know. And like, that's the story with most of the people. Actually, it's the story with all the people that I work with because I essentially last this time last year cleaned out any negative working relationships. <laughs> It's, it's it's good for you for sure yeah you know sometimes like you know like the person on the other side may not necessarily be a bad person or friend but like sometimes you just shouldn't be working with them and it's it's the mark of an intelligent person to be able to notice when something's not working and to move on <laughs> whenever you pick up your phone and see it's them on the car already and you go oh fuck it's like uh, maybe maybe this isn't the best for my health you know <laughs> exactly exactly you know when you think of when when the job becomes about just getting it fucking done instead of doing something worthwhile like that's when you know you should probably just move on (laughs) man i don't i don't know that's crazy that that's crazy that people have actually been like what what'd you say like negative working relationship or like well i mean because some people are really damaged and like they have unrealistic expectations of other people. Like Uh, the person person I'm thinking of in particular, like I didn't, well, like I did to an extent, but I like, I told myself it was about the job that we were doing. But like, once I got there, it was very clear that he was actually paying me for friendship and also getting mad at me for not doing the job in the way that he wanted as fast as he wanted. Like, it was just like, it was very unrealistic expectations. And that like, I, I was immersed in that this time last year. And then I did Bufo right after in Acapulco last year. And then I had, I, I rage quit the job somewhat inappropriately, but like, it was one of those things where like, it was six weeks of a really hellish working situation. And I was like, you know what? I'm, that's not worth it. I'd rather be poor. And like 2020 was like a process of rebuilding, but now I have my like work so decentralized that it doesn't matter if one of my jobs can't pay me anymore, which that happened at, at when coronavirus happened. Not only did I quit that job, like two or three of my other jobs were like, we can't afford to pay you. We want you, but we can't afford to pay you. 
I was like, oh, motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, it w- I was just thinking like, man, that's crazy that 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 you'd even have like a boss like that because like I don't know you've been amazing to work with like in every single way so and the stuff that you do for Agorish Nexus has been incredible and you've really been invaluable to our operation and uh, I'm really glad that you do stuff for us because there's some times where I'm like man like if I didn't have Lily like what would I do right now and so yeah, I was just surprised to hear that like somebody was like not loving you. But I guess I guess another que- like so a couple of these a lot of these questions that I have for you are questions that people I was like, man, if I had Lily on, like what would you ask her, right? And so a lot of these questions are like that. And but I want to switch gears to um to Mexico. What what's the COVID situation like in Mexico right now? It's it's ever changing. Um, I was actually right before this, I noticed and it, I was like somewhat second guessing because I'm moving out of the small town that I live in into a city. Um, I'm just going to keep it vague like that for now. Um, but and, and I was worried because the city has greater restrictions. The city is also like Mexico has like this, this like stoplight system, like red, green, yellow type thing. And like the city that I'm in is going back to red, I guess it like came out of it and like everything was pretty much wide open again. And then right as I started to move back, they moved back to red, but the locals don't seem to be tolerating complete closure. Cause like you can see signs all over the city that say like they shut everybody down for over a month. And I think the people were like, no, cause like the worst that we're dealing with right now is on Sundays, Nobody can, like, the only businesses that can be open are restaurants that deliver or that have Uber Eats. And then it's pharmacies. And the pharmacies, a lot of them have, like, grocery stores in them. Well, they can only sell medications on Sunday, which is fucking inconvenient because I need some cat litter. But, um, (laughs) so, like, I'm feeling a little oppressed in that regard. And I, and I guess they passed a law too that like nobody's enforcing it. It's funny because they said they passed a law that if you're caught outside without a mask and you tell the cop, no, they can take you to jail for two days for not wearing a mask. But when I went out the day after, there were a lot more people than usual without masks, which was interesting. Um, but it's wide open the rest of the week. So like all the businesses are open every other and it's stupid like that they close it on sunday because tomorrow me and everybody else in this fucking city is gonna go running out (laughs) you know in the public to buy all this shit that we didn't have today (laughs) so it's like so there are certain days of the week where they're like you can't go out these days it's well we can go out like nobody will bother you if you're out on the street like today is like a stay at home day it's only sundays um so like today's the virus is most active yeah supposedly (laughs) and uh (laughs) so i was like okay you know i've been walking my dog around without a mask and like nobody's bothered me it's it's and you see people out it's just like and you see some people like standing outside restaurants waiting for food, you know, because you can walk up to the restaurant, they can hand it to you, you can walk away, but you can't eat there. And it's like, and restaurants are the only thing open. Like I didn't have any meat today. So I had to spend like double what I usually do to order in some, some tacos because I was like, fuck, there's no food in this house. <laughs> what's the, um, what's like the attitude? Like, like, do, does the general public like believe In rural areas, the general public thinks it's a fucking joke. The place where I'm moving from, I'm actually a little disappointed, but I saw some photos of cops harassing non-essential businesses today. So, like, there are people that are out on the street selling, like, craft supplies and shoes and shit like that. And there were these photos of these cops harassing them and telling them to go away. (laughs) And it's just like, man. But, like, in in rural areas, the general population is just like, this is retarded. And then in the cities, you get some kind of, like, in the cities anywhere in Mexico, you get a lot of, like, Mexicans trying to be Americans. And 
those people are buying into it. Like my boyfriend's family, not not like his parents. His parents are like conspiracy theorists. I love them for it. But his sister and his brother are like, no, oh, the COVID or oh, the coronavirus. <laughs> and it's just like, oh my God. You know, his, his brother refuses to ride or ride in any public transportation now he will only go places that he can ride his bicycle in mexico city and he wears a full mask and everything he's been like shipping back expensive like high quality vitamin c to his mom to help keep her from getting sick and stuff like that and he's telling he's trying to he's gotten a vaccine already and he's trying to convince my boyfriend's mom to get the vaccine and she's just like no (laughs) It's funny. Like the probably other day a good I, move with the vitamin C though, just saying. Yeah, the the other day I was in the store and I had my first like ridiculous experience with a care and she didn't say anything to me, but her behavior was hilarious because like I thought I was alone in this line and I just like glanced behind me like I sometimes do waiting to check out. And ten feet behind me there's this woman in a full hazmat suit with her husband in a full hazmat suit and they have a cart. Get the fuck with- out. They had a cart with seven bottles of wine and a loaf of bread, and they were standing 15 feet behind me. And as soon as I looked at her, she walked away with her cart like I was going to come after her. I had my I had my mask kind of on, so like my nose was exposed. It, tra- it travels through eye rays. <laughs> it was awesomely hilarious. I was like, oh, okay, so there is some real fucking scared people in this town, and apparently they live off of wine and bread. <laughs> that is so crazy, man. And you know, it's funny because it sounds like it's kind of similar to what what I experience here, where it's like in the city things are really insane, but it's like I live out in the country, and I mean it's fine. You know what I mean? Like I do what I want, and I, I don't wear a mask, and nobody says anything to me. And plenty of people are wearing masks. I probably get some dirty looks, but you know, plenty of people and, aren't. And too, even you know, parts, and, and it's fine. But in parts, the cities, certain parts of the cities aren't so bad. Like the part of the city that I'm moving to is technically like right outside the central area, but like. I was there I, well, I was there last night and today and like last night there were a bunch of like there's like a place to buy beer that was open down the street and there were a bunch of like men of various ages walking up and down the street with bottles of beer you know like mask free just like it was nothing you know so like the little area that I live in it isn't so bad, but as soon as I get out of that little pocket into the main central area, then it's like cops directing people and they put hand sanitizer on you everywhere you go. I've gotten really good at bringing a bottle and pretending to put it on. <laughs> I'm I'm just so surprised that it's like more hardcore there than like it, it, it is here. And this is probably just me being a, a dumb American. So forgive me, everybody, but like here, like, people can't afford to be locked down, at least a lot of people, right. To not be able to have, you know, go to work, et cetera. And I know a lot of, you know, like third world countries and other places in the world, they really can't, but they're still doing that is, I mean, I just feel like in, like, you know, like in Mexico, like people would be like, I'm going to fucking work. You know what I mean? Like I gotta eat. Well, they are like, you know, I, I, they tried to shut everything down and the people like, were like, no more, we can't, you know? And now like, Today is supposedly supposed to be totally locked down, but I drove to my house to, I like essentially tossed all my fucking cactus into some boxes yesterday and moved them. (laughs) So I wanted to make sure they were okay. And, um, you know, going over there, I was looking to see what was open and it was pharmacies and nearly every single restaurant was open. They just had like tape saying you couldn't come inside and they were handing food out and there were delivery guys all over the place. So, like, it's shut down, supposedly, but it's not shut down, you know, like. Right. And it's only one day a week that they're managing to do this. I think the people so would blatantly weird, refuse. Man. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know. This just seems so blatantly, like, phony when they do it doesn't. Like that, it doesn't make any you know? sense. Like, it would make, for me, if I were to really think about, like, how viruses work, if you just leave everything open all the time, people are going to go out when they usually go out. There's going to be no congestion. If anything, have it so things are open 24 hours so people could go at 2 in the fucking morning to places they usually can't. 
and hey, further disperse right. it. That's how you deal with it. Like it's 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 like it's like a market, right? When people who are really scared of this, they're gonna pick the times when it's least congested to go out and go shopping. People who don't care are gonna go when it's most convenient to them. But when you restrict hours and you only have one entrance to the store open for some reason, everybody or, has to or walk like by one each entrance other at, to the know, market. Like they have these markets yeah. here and they're like these buildings and usually these buildings have like 10 to 15 different entrances and now they are reduced to literally one entrance. And it's like, how is this helping? It makes <laughs> no fucking sense. <laughs> it's like so it's a, the, the city, the, the little city by where I, I'm moving away from, like they have like pretty much every city in Mexico has like a central square and like, this one square for pretty much most of the year has been entirely blocked off. Yet for most of the year, all of the businesses that were in the middle of that square are now clustered very close together on the edge of the square. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, motherfucker. Uh, I, 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 I just really expected you to say that like, oh yeah, Mexico, nobody gives a shit. It's fine. I did not expect you to say that things are... Honestly, it's went farther than I there. expected. And like my boyfriend, he's convinced that like, it's not going to go further than this, but it's already gone further than I expected. So all bets are off at this point. Who fucking knows? You know, yeah, like they've already got vaccines here and they're giving them out in Mexico City and stuff like that. Like I had somebody offer me a fucking vaccine. They were just walking down the street with them in coolers. I was like, no fucking thank you. <laughs> so like if they're doing that in rural Mexico, you best believe that this plan, because like my 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 boyfriend's argument for oh it won't go any further than this is oh Mexico doesn't have the infrastructure. I'm like you don't understand that what's happening is a global thing funded by global money. Bill Gates <laughs> will give him the infrastructure, right? Exactly, Bill Gates and all of his fucking cronies are providing the in- infrastructure. You know, like you think Bill Gates isn't gonna donate fucking millions and millions of vaccines to Mexico? Why wouldn't he? Do you think do you think vaccines could be mandatory in Mexico? Yeah, that's one of those things that like they might issue a law saying that they are, but it's one of those things that it's going to be hard to enforce in Mexico unless Bill Gates also upgrades their entire like internet government infrastructure because like you know how like the u.s government was like 20 years ago where like the internet existed but like the u.s government wasn't all like up in it you know it wasn't all connected the police cars weren't all connected on the same systems and all of that shit like all those advanced systems that they have in the united states they don't currently have in mexico and i know this because like police chase outside of Mexico city. The cop wanted to try and call on her motorcycle to see if it was registered as stolen. He couldn't do it. He was federal police. He had a car and he had to call and have somebody at the office, look it up for him. And if the phone was busy, well, he just couldn't look it up. (laughs) And that was, that was two and a half years ago. So like, they just don't have the systems here to cooperate with each other. Like I've even been told because I've considered doing the asylum process here in Mexico and maybe I will eventually. Uh, and like, because uh, from my understanding, the office to do the asylum thing is within immigration, but they don't talk to each other. And so like, if you get denied for asylum, they don't go and tell immigration, Hey, we denied them deport their asses. They just, okay, that's a denial. You can appeal if you want or not. And that's it, even though they're with an immigration. <laughs> the deportation <laughs> like, part, that's not our job. Like, <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's exactly because, like, I called their offices and I was asking for quite information. And I was like, so if for some reason I'm denied, you won't deport me? They're like, that's not our department. <laughs> like, nice. oh, again. Okay. And they're like, yeah, no, you would have to get, like, picked up by immigration and then deported in a separate incident. But no, we will not report your, we do not report the results of the Comar to immigration. It's like, wow, okay. <laughs> now, even if they did make vaccines mandatory there, I guess it would be pretty easy just to, like, pay off a doctor and say, 
right? I exactly. Mean, there are a lot of like doctors and shit here that are against coronavirus enough to where you could do that. Like, and it's also like, it's hard to enforce, you know, like it's hard to enforce that shit in Mexico. Yeah. Or you could just be like, I already got one. And like, how would they, how would they know? Right. Like, exactly. Um, so, uh, we get, we got, we have to pause for a second, but um, we'll be right back. But we want to give a quick shout out to our, our sponsor, Devault DVT cryptocurrency. They've been amazing and a really nice, small cap, innovative uh, crypto coin that does cold stake rewards. They'll have privacy features coming soon in terms of Terraform, a great government structure, and 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 DeFi coming soon on the platform. And for how small of a project it is, I've really been amazed at how how innovative and a- adaptive that this project is. I mean, it's a proof of work coin where you can stake to get to get rewards or you know interest or whatever. So with that said, we'll get back to it. So Lily, I want to switch gears real quick to now one of your articles is extremely popular on LRBY. It's the most viewed video that Agorish Nexus has at the moment and it's called uh how to bug out to Mexico. So I want to yeah, it's it's been I don't I think maybe because of COVID everyone's like, well, you know, let me let me look into this and so if you guys want to read that, go ahead and read that on Agorist Nexus or if you're, or if you don't like reading and you just want to listen to it. All of our audiobooks are on LRBY or or what is called Odyssey, which is a great platform. They they give you crypto for watching videos and stuff, so but all that is there. But uh any new advice on how to bug out to Mexico and what, like, I don't want to go into every detail because I want people to look at the article, but what are like your main pieces of, of advice? Shit. I, it's been so long since I've written that one. And like, if I remember correctly, it was basically just preparing the shit that you have, having enough, having the right kind of like income or, you know, savings, if you will depending on who you are. Yeah, I need to go look at that post. It's been so long. I've written so many posts since then, and I fully immerse myself when I write it, and then I forget about it when I move on. <laughs> so I'm going to go look that up real quick. Yeah, it's on, yeah, on, LRB, on Odyssey LRBY, that's, that's been the most hit video, which is, um, which is funny. I'm like, wow, this thing exploded. So I wonder, uh, I kind of wonder, like, what, you know, if people are just curious or like if they actually want to. Like... I've had, I have had a lot of people reach out to me and ask me, like, how do you get out there? How do you assimilate? Stuff like that. Um, I'm scrolling through it now. Yeah, I talked a lot about things like where to go in Mexico, how to travel, because like it kind of really depends on who you are and what you're working with that determines your experience. For example, like I don't have a whole lot of money, so I travel as cheaply as possible and I live as cheaply as possible. But I also kind of have a Mexican standard of living. Like my bathroom at my new place is technically outdoors. (laughs) I'm fine with that, but not everybody is. So like you kind of basically have to figure out what your needs are in terms of living because for some people, certain things are non-negotiable. For me, it's I have to have my animals in my garden. Um, so you kind of have to figure out your priorities, what things you need. If you don't have an income, you need a savings because, like, being in Mexico is fucking hard when you're broke. Like, it's it's really hard, especially because all the Mexicans expect you to have more money and they charge you more. <laughs> but it's just like, fuck, I'm not a gringo. Like, I'm not rich. I like to say no soy gringa rica, which means I'm not a rich, not a rich white lady. <laughs> <laughs> it's like but, a positive stereotype, stereotyping, stereotism. Yeah, there, there's definitely like, and be aware of that, like if you're light skinned, unless you look kind of Mexican, you will be treated differently here in both a positive manner and a negative manner. Negatively, it's just higher prices and shit like that. And people try to take advantage of you and sell you shit you don't need. Um, or sell you broken shit. 
But if you just keep your wits about you, um, I also talked about things needed, but like, yeah, try and come where with a passport if you can. I know that's not very agorist, but like, my life is so fucking hard. <laughs> I'm I'm get, trying to get to a point to where I'm fully legal, so I can just like live my life, you know, because. At this point, what I do is not very illegal or revolutionary. Well, I guess it is, but, like, it's not very illegal in the same ways other than the fact that I'm living here illegally. Um, I guess, like... Oh, sorry, um, go on. Yeah, I talked about vehicles. Vehicles are only necessary in the country, but, like, unless you got a dog, vehicles are not necessary at all. I've got a theory that you can, like... They have these cheap taxis they call collectivos or something like that combis depending on where you are and they have like a set route on like a 10 to 15 peso cost and you go from one end to the end, other end of it and i got a theory that you could like take those across mexico from end to end you know very cheaply with no problems because of how plentiful um public transport is like even out in the middle of nowhere where i live there was always taxis or vans driving by to take you up or down. You do not need a vehicle in the out in the middle of nowhere. Even to get to the city, it's only like to go like three and a half hours away. It's only like seven bucks. So you just kind of, you know, public transportation is amazing in Mexico. And you can it's also travel season. without well, IDs. It's, it's pri- well, it's well, pri- it's all private, right? But it's like exactly, exactly. That, Even the buses, like okay. you don't have to have an ID. You can just get that, on. Them. That was going to be my question: Are these government transportation services, or are these just private people doing this? Because that obviously makes a huge so, difference. With some of them cost are like in Mexico. <laughs> in Mexico City, they have like an amazing subway system that's government. But and and that's like five pesos to ride from one end of Mexico City to the other. And you can ride multiple trains. So you can get off one train and get on another train and then get off that train and get on a third train. As long as you don't leave the but the subway station, you pay five pesos. Which is isn't a lot, right? No, that's like again, dumb American, sorry. Yeah, so it's like twenty five cents or something. It's, it's like twenty five cents. <laughs> Yeah, it's like twenty okay, well, cents so super fast. Yeah, yeah. That that's what I noticed when I was when I was down there is that um, I could like there's all kinds of these just like vans that that will like like you'll see people waiting in certain spots and I'm like why is that person waiting there and then there'll be like a uh, a a cop drives what? by and you just wave it wait you wave them yeah down. It's great they yeah do whatever you want yeah. And especially if you're white, they're they're like, oh yeah, yeah, hey. hey. <laughs> but yeah, I'll see people just waiting, and these vans will just just drive by and start, you know, taking people there. And they're like, yeah, ten pesos, and it's just like this little ten peso coin, which is like forty, fifty cents or something. And it's like, sweet, I just got, you know, something that would cost me like ten bucks in the U.S. cost me like. You know, fifty cents. So yeah, yeah. To go like forty-five minutes away to the nearest city, like where I was living before, it was like three dollars a person for the luxury ride. You know, and it's like, damn, like you couldn't travel like this in the U.S. Like you just can't. Even Uber, Uber in the city to go from one end of the city to the other, it as long as it's not like in the middle of the night, is like fifty pesos. <laughs> Cheaper than taxis. Yeah, and and that what what's crazy about it is that you know not much things are more expensive than Me- in in Mexico than like um let's say the U.S. But like uh the three things are like you know <clears throat> the three things that are more expensive there are like guns, cars, and like gasoline and electronics, right? Or four things. And, you know, gasoline's one of them. Gasoline's more expensive in Mexico and they sell it by the leader. So you're right. You're right. I I just like, so it's like, how is it cheaper for me to go from one spot to another? But it's like, you know, the gasoline's more expensive. The city that I'm in, they have this whole network of like, combis that drive around and they all have these set routes and there's an app that you can use so you can figure out what what fucking combi to take and everything and i've always wondered like how in the fuck is it so cheap 
And like I saw the other day, there's a natural gas gas station in this city, and all of the taxis and combis fill up there. And natural yeah, gas CNG, in Mexico is way cheaper. CNG. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, a lot of people are starting to do that here too, because I guess since they made fracking, fracking's been more prolific, you know, there's a lot more natural gas. Yeah. We have a lot of like, you'll see a lot of like uh, state vehicles, like sheriff's cars run off like propane. We had a car in my shop the other day. It was compressed natural gas. I've worked on several semis that do the compressed natural gas. So I could definitely see that. Yeah. Being cheaper. Gasoline is so expensive. Yeah. So that seems to be the reality for like the majority of these things. Um, and it's interesting. Like, I didn't expect, like, transportation to be so readily available. But literally everywhere I've gone, there's always a way to get from one place to another for cheap. Always. It's it's astounding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've noticed that. I noticed that, too. And, um, like, when I'm in the U.S., it's like, oh, man, like, I'm, st like, I'm, like, stranded in this one spot. Like, what do I do? And, you know, it it's kind of nice to see that like Mexico, it just feels like the market always kind of provides for you. Um, the U S it's like, I don't know. If, if you're willing to listen to the market, that is, you know, like I've, I've seen some people come here and have a hard time, but it's like, you have to really be willing to go with the flow in Mexico. And like the biggest piece of advice I can give to anybody coming here is do not expect anything to be what you are used to, you know, I've had a lot of people come here and have a really hard time because of s simple, but obvious things like the food's too different or everything's in Spanish. <laughs> and it's like, shocker. Yeah. Whereas like at this point, I've been in Mexico almost five years and I've been discussing the idea of maybe going back to the U S to visit after I get my legal shit fixed. And it's like, I don't know if I could assimilate back into the United States culture because I have grown, especially as an autistic introvert, I have grown really accustomed to being in Mexico. And most people don't expect me to speak Spanish, so most people don't fucking talk to me. <laughs> so, like, having to deal with... And, and when I deal with people that speak English here, I'm weirded out by it at this point, which is hilarious, you know? <laughs> so... That's really interesting, you know, thinking about like, let's say it's a place that, you know, let's say, you know, typical, you know, Americans are, okay, whatever, they're, you know, more, I mean, I don't want to say Mexico's their world, but you know what I mean, they're, they're poor or whatever, there's going to be, you know, it's going to be a lot different than the way things are here, and we're so well taken care of by our government. Even, even the but poor it, people have like, toilets and running water and stuff there, but the poor of the poor here they use mm -hmm. like buckets of water to flush their toilet that they dig out of right. the well. <laughs> it's, you, you know, be, but because it's like a lot of stuff's more like unregulated or whatever, right? Or they don't have the size of government that we do. Like a lot of things that, you, you know, like people like the three of us really like, you know, like market market solutions, you know, it seems like they're more able to flourish and look, look what you get. You have a, you have a basically a, a non, a non-organized transportation system that works better you know, or it seems like in a lot of ways it works better or, or can work, yeah, you know, for, for poor people, they can get where they need to go. We're here. It's yeah, harder. It, it, it's crazy. Cause even like, you know, like there's also these things that are called, you guys will love this. They're called pirate taxis. And these pirate taxis are not licensed taxis. These are, they're technically cartel taxis from my understanding, but like the cartel basically buy the car, buy these cars, they set up a route and then they get customers. They sit on these corners and they yell, um, you know, vamos para this city. And they yell at you. And if you want to go there, you get in their car, you pay them a certain amount of money for your seat. And they fill that car up with as many people as they can fit in it. And they go that route. And you get there and you pay the money. And like, it's totally unregulated. It's like, it, it takes like half the time that a bus does at the same route at the same price. But there are solutions like that all over Mexico. Like, it's awesome. <laughs> like you said, you kind of got to be, you got kind of got to have that mindset and be willing to go with the flow, though. And I definitely see a lot of like Americans, like they, they wanted a set of instructions, you know, here's how you do this, here's how you do that, you know, for, you know, here's the schedule for this or that, you know. But, but like you said, if you're able to go with that, go with the flow and sort of work it, you know, work within the, work within the markets, you know, oh, I don't know, I'm getting excited. Just like, <laughs> 
<laughs> talking about this and just being able to, uh, I, I just love the flexibility of market solutions, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, a, like, that's super cool. Me- and Mexico is a paradise for markets in general because, like, my first, the, my favorite thing to do when I get to any city, the first thing I do when I enter any city is go to the markets, whether I've been there or not. You know, like in Acapulco at the Central Market, I have probably about 10 to 15 vendors that I go and I just say hey to every time I'm there. You know, like last year I got to, it was, it was kind of bittersweet because the year of the murder, I was still going. Like right after the murder, I was still going to the central market for my food and I had to buy clothes because I literally lost everything, including all my clothes. So like I was going to the market and everybody knew what happened. They'd seen it in the news and like it was all very bittersweet. And then I disappear for a year. And then last year I come back, but happy, you know, and (laughs) I, I make my rounds, you know, and like it's the same in that little town that I have. I have my butcher and I have my favorite, you know, fruit guy because he always gives me deal and there's the best tortilla person. And it's cool to see like markets just functioning. And like my favorite is there's nothing more exciting to me than walking in a dirty ass market building in Mexico where everything is piled on top of each other. And you just kind of have to like stop and stare to really take in everything because you can't just like walk by slowly and expect to catch it all you have to like stop and look you know it's like there's so much density of things available like they have they make they make these grills and these stove tops and all these things based off of like the needs of these taco stands and it's just cool to see how they provide for market demand like there's people walking around with with taco stands on on bikes with little propane ca- tanks that like strapped to the bike that are made in Mexico, you know, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool to see all the Yeah, that's super that cool. Do you address in that article at all um, language or, you know, um, recommendations on how to, or the necessity of learning like Spanish? I do. How, how much um, Spanish do you speak? At this point, I, I, I'm to the point to where I can understand pretty good Spanish, you know, to the point to where like, I realize, you know, some people say things in Spanish in front of me thinking that I don't understand what they're saying, but I'm sitting there watching them like, you motherfuckers, you know, like everything (laughs) from like, I'll walk by like a group of guys because I'm, I'm not like, I don't consider myself exceptionally attractive, but I am a white haired or I'm a white skinned, red haired lady in Mexico, which is like it's kind of a a big fetish. So like I walk by a group of guys and I'm by myself and they say some really disgusting things, you know, like, it's like, Oh, okay. You know, or people just think I'm a fucking idiot and they're all, she can't fucking understand us anyway. And it's like, no, I can, (laughs) I just can't speak very much. Um, I've kind of always had issues communicating though. So like communicating in the moment for me, like I was the kid, I'm not so much this way now with English, but I was the kid that like, I would get into arguments with people and not be able to say a word. And then like five to seven hours later, what I needed to say to that person will fucking hit me, but it'll be too late. (laughs) And that's kind of where I'm at with Spanish currently. Like I'll, I'll, I'll not be able to say anything other than maybe like one or two words in the moment. And then later I'll just be sitting there crocheting and the whole sentence that I needed to say in proper grammar will come to my head. It's like, (laughs) okay. My, my boyfriend, he's going bananas because I keep calling, like, I've been living in Mexico for five years and I've been calling the pharmacies here pharmacias because I'm, I'm fucking, I'm a white lady. But um, it, the last, like, three days, every time I say it, he's always like, pharmacia. <laughs> so, you know, it, Mine it is helps. rice. I, yeah. I try and say, I'm like, and they're like, and I'm like, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but apparently my, I'm not my saying favorite, right. <laughs> my current favorite, my for current favorite cut of beef is like skirt steak. But in Spanish, that's with two R's, arachera. But that's not how you say it. Because every time I say that to them, they look at me like I have six heads. And it's like, <sighs> also. That, that sounds like a fun one, but I'm not going to attempt that on air. <laughs> yeah. Also, also something else that like, is hard to deal with uh, is 
Um, and I'm, I'm noticing this more as I get better with Spanish. There will be times where I know because like I'm practicing, my boyfriend's a Spanish teacher. So like he, I practice with him here and there. So I know I'm saying the right fucking thing. You know, one example is Gasputano. You know, you can't really fuck that one up. And I'll say that to them and they'll be like, huh? huh because they're so surprised that there's a white lady in their store and then like i'll ask my boyfriend and he'll say it in the exact same way oh tina's gas and they're like oh see and it's like fucking a like <laughs> that's what i said yeah it drives me nuts because it's like they get so flustered by me talking to them that it's like i know i've you know it's something like i'll know that i've ordered before and i know i can say correctly that's easy to say and they just like what what or like sometimes there will be more than one person and what the person dealing with you is like, I don't know what the fuck you're saying. And then the person behind them will like yell out what you're saying the exact way you say it. And they're like, Oh, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think sometimes accents are um, kind of throw people off, but another thing I wanted to talk, like, I guess the U S we're so brainwashed, right? Like, and I think, I think the government does this on purpose. And when I say government, I mean like the media, because the media is really just like a propaganda arm of the government. And most countries, especially the U.S., we just have like pretty much Soviet style propaganda. They're just they're just better at hiding it. Right. But I think we're so brainwashed. I think this is because the government doesn't want people to know that that Mexico's for freer country because we're, we're we were always I don't know about you guys. I think you guys are kind of in my um, generation, but it's like we were brought up to believe that, that, you know, the U S was this bright beacon on the hill of, of Liberty. And we live in the land of the free and home of the brave and all this stuff. And so I think they kind of, when people get on to Mexico, I think they kind of like lose face and, and, and a lot of people are like, wow, like, yeah. I can do more down there than I could in the U.S. Like, what? One great personal example of this is my dad. My dad, I love him. He's my dad is like pretty technologically retarded. Um, if I remember correctly, he told me he didn't graduate high school because he, he, there was a typing class required, and he basically, I'm pretty sure, smashed a typewriter and walked out. He was that technologically like inept. But now he's like. He came down to Mexico last year and he was in Acapulco for an Acapulco and he experienced Mexico firsthand. My dad's been racist against Mexicans for most of my life. I told him once I was thinking of moving to Mexico and he told me I was insane. But he came here and by the time he was leaving, he was like, I got to figure out a way to move here, you know? And I talked to him a few days ago. My dad's always been pretty awake. Like my dad's the one that taught me that voting is worthless and taxation is theft and all of that. But he's never been like super connected or intelligent about it. And he said uh, he got a smartphone a couple months ago and he's been following both like Facebook and like stuff. That, you know, he follows me on Facebook and stuff. And then he's been following like the news, like the Capitol and all of that stuff that happened. And my dad is just like, he's waking up because of all of this, you know? And the propaganda is having the opposite effect for a lot of these people. Like some of the people, alternatively, I have like friends on my friends list from high school and I'm really good at like not getting into arguments, even though I think they're being idiots. But like, you see them buying into it, you know? Oh, Bernie Sanders is going to save the day. Let's celebrate his his inauguration and all of that bullshit. And it's like, it's interesting to see the contrast of that from afar. <laughs> Here, like the, the media, like what's interesting about Mexico and the media is anything like advertising is referred to as propaganda. That's the word that they use for it. And that's for the news and everything. So like, here it's more mainstream of, hey, that's just what the news is feeding you, you know? Like, it was cool because my boyfriend's parents, they're like, fucking, they're old. <laughs> they're like 70 years old. And they've been watching all the news of this coronavirus and reading all of this fear porn. And there's a lot of fear porn in Mexico. But like, even still reading all that fear porn, they had their wits about them, about it, you know? Yeah, yeah, they're like... 
it's just propaganda. I've noticed like, and I've noticed like people are more like culturally, like, even though like there's like less, I'd say there's like less laws and, and less regulations, people are just like more culturally like freedom oriented than the U.S. And, and that's pretty crazy to say because it's supposed to be the land of the free home of the brave. Right. But like, so for instance, like I was, I was like walking down the street with the beer. I, I was like cracking open a beer at McDonald's. And like, if I had done that in the U S there'd be people calling the cops. There'd be cops there in minutes. Right. Like I have know. a crazy story like that from when we first moved to Mexico, I was talking about this to my boyfriend the other day. Um, because anybody that's driven through Mexico knows there's these things called topes, which are fucking speed bumps the size of dead bodies, and they don't mark them. <laughs> and um, we were, like, driving through Mexico, and we ce- celebrated with our friend the fact that we were in Mexico, and we bought a bottle of tequila, partially because n- none of us had tried tequila. And um, our friend bought it be- as a source of pride because he was, like, 19 at the time, and the drinking age here is 18. So he was like, ooh, I'm going to buy a bottle of tequila. And at one point, we were standing on the side of the road, just stopped for a few minutes, chugging out this bottle. Like my friend, my youngest friend, my 19 year old friend, just chugging out of this bottle of, be- out of tequila. And two federal police trucks drive by. We're on the side of the road, standing next to our vehicles with nothing around us in the desert. And they just kept rolling. They said nothing. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, that's normal. And <laughs> when I was cracking open the beer, when I was cracking open my beer in McDonald's, I was, I like looked over and I'm like, oh shit, I wonder if these people are going to say anything. And they walked by like, like that was like normal. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, even the people are just like more, I don't know what you want to say, like, um, accepting or like, Oh, uh, he's just having a beer in the McDonald's. Like he's not hurting anybody. You know, like nobody's no, yeah, you know, like, nobody's shocked or like yeah, they only get by a problem. It. They only get a problem when you start hurting people. Like even drunk driving's not bad here. Like I've been in I've been in taxis with drunk drivers before. They've had beers in their hand. That's how I knew they were drunk. Like it wasn't just their driving. You know. Mm. It's just, it's just a different culture in that. Yeah, like, I was more responsible culture. My, um, my taxi driver was like, was like, uh, I was like, man, I really want one of these beers right now. And my taxi driver's like, crack it open, bro. And so I, I it, it's kind of crazy to like be in a car that's moving and like drinking beer and, and, you know, uh, even taking shots like while the car's moving. Cause like, doing that in the u.s like you know it's pretty i have been kicked out of you, know, you can get into a lot of trouble for doing taxi. that what what, what was that <laughs> oh. i've been kicked out of both a waffle house and a taxi for drinking in them so <laughs> i will second that but yes that's a waffle house come on you should be allowed to drink in a fucking waffle house anyway. yeah, aren't, those, aren't those like made for drunk people the only time i've yeah, ever I been in a waffle house yeah people. exactly <laughs> it was exactly. 3 a.m come on exactly <laughs> Well, and people are like, well, that's just drinking. That's just me- Mexico. And I'm like, no, that's like in every like fashion and, and you know, faucet. Po- like you could set up, you could set up like your own little store on the side of the road and, and, you know, nobody would care. But in the U.S., it's like, do you have a permit to sell? Do you have uh, paperwork? Did you clarify with the city that, that, that you could be in this spot? And you know, it's just, it's really just every single category. It's just like Mexico is just freer, it, except for maybe like, except for maybe like, like right now, I'd say like mar- maybe marijuana is a little bit more free in, in the U.S. than Mexico. And, yeah, and, and Mexico only in certain, goes. and only in certain states. What was that, Dak? I thought that uh, Mexico um, decriminalized like small amounts of. Or was it just Mexico City? Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Well, well, no, amounts, Mexico, like Me- Mexico is um, it's opening up, and I think Mexico is going to be freer faster than the United States, federally speaking. The thing is, like, they are regulating the shit out of it because, like, the cartels have essentially in a lot of ways had to improvise, you know, and come up with new sources of income because the United States has been the source of cannabis. 
so they're trying to change that and they are changing that like quality is increasing by quite a bit here but like yeah it's 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 not what i expected i expected it to be better when i moved to mexico <laughs> now yeah I feel like, and like go ahead dax sorry I was just going to go back to what you were saying a couple minutes ago. I just feel like outrage is kind of like a privilege, you know, and besides the fact that we're brought up in what, 15,000 hours of government indoctrination camps that teach us to go teach your teacher anytime something is not right. You know what I mean? Or somebody's doing something, you know, against the rules, you know, we're brought up that way. And I almost just feel like in places where it's like, people have bigger shit to worry about and they're not brought up like that. It's like, why do they care if you're cracking a beer in, you know, McDonald's, you know, it's just, I, I can just see why that's like a different culture when you're just not brought up in the, I, I don't know, like, it's, it's just weird because America is supposed to be so free, but yet we are brought up in this big nanny state and again, just taught to have an issue with everything and tattle on everybody and uh, it's silly. I'm over it. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, uh, you know, Lily brought up a uh, subject that I wanted to touch on, the cartels and crime and what to look out for when you're down there. It's kind of like three questions all in one there, Lily. Well, like, um, the thing with cartels is, like, a lot of people, when I moved to Mexico, a lot of people were telling me, if you don't ever get involved in illegal things or, you know, or drugs specifically, you'll never have problems from the cartel. However, it... It really doesn't matter what you do if you're having a successful business that's competing with the cartel. And there are people dying, you know, like, for example, in Michoacan, every year the monarch butterflies land. And where the monarch butterflies land, there are these men that are hired to guard the forest, sanctuary workers, basically. And those guys are like, the part of their job is to keep the cartel from cutting down the trees that the monarchs land on because if the monarchs have no trees, they, they, they land on these super old specific type of pine tree and they just sit there and eat the sap all winter until they fly back north. And if they don't have those trees, then the population goes to shit. I kind of have a hunch that a big part of why the population went to shit was because of unchecked cartel logging in Mexico. So a lot of them got here and fucking died. And like just in the last two years alone, like I, I've heard of at least three people protecting butterflies who have been killed by cartel. When I lived in Acapulco, I knew a guy that he had a tortilla stand. He didn't pay extortion. He got killed. Another guy was a taxi driver, not a corrupt, corrupt taxi driver. He just refused to give up his brand new car that he had worked for years for like he just upgraded his car and they stole his car, tried to, and when he tried to re refuse, they shot him and killed him. You know? So it's like, that's my, my advice for most gringos. Like, one, if you're going to come here, have money from elsewhere. Two, if you have money from elsewhere, do not talk to the Mexicans, any Mexicans, about how much money you have or how you make your money. I know a lot of, like, white people come here and are, like, talking to anybody that'll fucking listen to them about Bitcoin. I don't talk to people about Bitcoin here. I don't let the people I buy from know that I have any involvement with cryptocurrency because that puts a target on your back. You're going to give up your codes if you've got a gun to your head. And they know how that shit works. So, like... I just say to be cautious. And then, like, the final thing is, like, be respectful. Um, a big part of what I think happened to me was I had a knack of being disrespectful to people, um, both locally and gringo. And I think it was a perfect storm of... Who, who did? You know, um, John John did. Yeah, basically, he... The, the reason, a big part of why he ended up getting killed was he pissed off a lot of people. <laughs> You know, and like that all turned into a perfect storm. But if you're respectful towards people, you know, like when I when I'm out by myself and I walk by people, I say, oh, you know, buenos dias, buenos tardes, depending on what time of day it is. You know, I, I'm always very friendly to people and I don't have problems. But I also like a couple weeks ago, I had a curious um, taxi driver. Also, taxi drivers, 
a lot of times can be hired by cartel to fish for information from white people. If you have a taxi driver asking you a whole bunch of information, like how much do you pay for rent and how much do you make and where do you work and what do you do? Like, unless you know it's a trustworthy taxi driver, don't talk about that shit. Or if you do, do it like I did. Like I was explaining to this taxi driver about a week ago, oh, I work online. Yeah, I work for people in the U.S. He's like, oh, you have good money? And I'm like, oh, well, I wish I made more money. You know, I don't make that much money. I was like, you know, I can pay my rent. I can pay for the basics, for food. But, like, if anybody asks how you how much money you have or how much money you make, you tell them you work your ass off for nothing. <sighs> they have more respect for you that way. They give you better prices. And it makes it so you're not a target, you know. And, like, also flashy behaviors, like, going out to the bar and flashing your money around and stuff like that are is good ways to get people wanting to take advantage of you. You know, at the very least, you could get somebody scamming you out of some money or something like that. At the most, people have been threatened at, with, at gunpoint for their shit, you know. So, you just have to be aware and... If you don't have street smarts, stick to tourist safe areas. And if you do have street smarts, the non-tourist areas can be a haven. We were talking to um to Cat uh on here. Um uh, homestead guru, is that how you'd refer to her as? Yeah. I don't know. Cat. That cat. Cat bonus. <laughs> <And, laughs> yes, that girl. And we uh we were talking about sort of similar things and, and you know, it's, it's funny cause she made a really good point and it's like, you know, a lot of the stuff, it's like, it's kind of the same kind of thing for a lot of places in the United States or pretty much any city in the country. You know, there's places where all those same rules that you just laid out should apply. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. Don't be bragging about shit you got if you don't want to get it again, you know, um, and, and, and stuff like that. So, and the reason I bring that up is it's just like a lot of people who, you know, let's say Americans who are, propping guys prop into guys that we're the best place in the world right it's like, oh no mexico's terrifying you can't go there you're gonna get kidnapped you know and this and that and it's like man like i don't know a lot of people will go there but it's you know it's the you know the same kind of thing you got to be smart you, you know wherever yeah. you're at you got to be really aware of your surroundings and maybe but it's just but, brought up in even, our culture to even, brag more than we should <laughs> yeah but even still like i mean i've been humbled a few times in mexico like like oh, about sure. a, like about a year and a half ago i um I was, I had just moved out to the middle of nowhere and I'm like, I'm very directionally challenged when it comes to new places. And I ended up on a combi that went way out into the middle of nowhere. Like I knew immediately it was going the wrong way, but I didn't like have the guts to tell the guy to stop. So I was like, oh, it'll probably be like a half hour round trip. You know, it's how it usually is. But it was three hours out into the wilderness. And for most of the time, I was alone with this guy, like just one guy in this van. And I also at the time, I didn't pay my cell phone bill. So I had no way to contact anybody. Worst situation you could have, right? But like he he realized that I was on edge and he turned it into a tour guide, a tour. So like when we would pass through like tiny little towns, he'd be like, okay, this is this. And then this is this. And you know, see, there's a school there and that's it. <laughs> and it, we were on dirt roads and shit, like driving deep into the mountains. And it cost me like four dollars by the end of it. Like because like I had to pay for the trip all the way there and back. You you pay based off of how far you go. But like and then I get I, I get some money on my phone and my boyfriend sent, had sent me like four or five messages like, where are you in the last couple of hours? And I'm like, oh, I accidentally went to Lamoda. And he's like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. <laughs> but nothing happened, you know? Like, so, like, Mexico is one of those places that, like, the danger is vastly overhyped. I will also say, I know three people who have been murdered in my lifetime. Two of them were in Ohio. Yeah. So, yeah. It's one of those things where, like, I can't say it's, you know it's any more dangerous here. I think it's a lot safer for the average person. It's definitely safer for kids. Like kids can still run around here without much worry, you know. Back in the 70s, my parents uh lived uh lived on a, a sailboat. Um 
over here and they used to sail to Mexico. They did it several times and, uh, you know, by the stars and shit, super cool. But anyhow, they wouldn't, they would not do that on the other side of Florida. They would not do that in the Atlantic. You know, they'd go to Mexico. It was a good time, you know, but they would not do that in the Atlantic because it was too dangerous, you know? So I guess what I'm saying is like, it's not, you know, again, like the way that it's portrayed to us, it's like this super crazy, dangerous, you may as well be the Middle East kind of place, you know, and it might not really be that bad. I mean, in my experience, it's rarely been that bad. Like, even my dad, who was like extremely skeptical, like he left here just like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Like at one point, like my dad got separated from me and I actually did freak out a little bit only because he didn't have a working cell phone. And he just wandered off in Acapulco, Mexico by himself. But I found him like, I don't know, like a mile down the beach, laying on a on a massage table, getting a $15 massage from some random lady. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we, you, your dad goes missing in, in Mexico and you're like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. You finally find him and he's just getting a massage. And it's like, that's pretty much what life is like here. Do we want to talk about your new book? I would like to. Um, the new book, like, realistically, it's kind of like my guide for how I got the hell over everything. Because, like, most people are like, okay, you got through all of that. But, like, how? <coughs> They're like, how are you not fucking super depressed, you know, and losing your shit all the time? And realistically, the only thing that kept me from going completely crazy was my crafting specifically my crochet and that book was like born um because I'm a content creator and I've been trying to figure out new ways to monetize what I know and I was like oh I see all these crafters making patterns and selling their patterns online I'll start doing that well like my ADHD brain is really good at compiling content but not so good at getting it out all the time so like I ended up with you know, 20 craft patterns from over like last couple of years that I just didn't have the capacity to get out. I had never done it before. So I had never gotten over that initial hurdle. And I was like, I was also at the time rebuilding the guru store. And I was like, oh, we've got ebooks here. Hmm, I want to come up with my own ebook. And then like, oh, wait, I have all these craft patterns. And like, not only that, I take photos of everything I make as I make it just from habit and so I had all these step-by-step -step photos already like that I just had to compile and it just became my project my goal was to write it and publish it in one month and I was on track to do that and then I fucking deleted the book it's a long story but I didn't back it up correctly so I had to rewrite it and uh that took like Ouch. two yeah that took like two months I was almost done too I was so mad it took like two months and and like two two weeks on top of that to do the graphic design for it because I turned it into essentially like a really colorful digital scrapbook of sorts with really in-depth instructions of how to make everything. And it was like essentially my brainchild, you know? And then I, I, I put it up for sale in that store that I built and I built that store to accept cryptocurrency too, so... That was pretty cool, you know, so I was able to self-publish. I did all of the process myself from writing it to taking the photos to putting everything together and publishing. And now I'm in the process of marketing it, um, which I sell it at the Homestead Guru website. And it's also for sale at Liberty Under Attack Publications. I'm also going to talk with Dana Martin because she's starting her own like independent publisher so I'll probably have it on Agora's Nexus eventually too for sale. And yeah, it's been my way of trying to monetize everything that I went through, you know, because <laughs> I, I, the way I felt at the time, um, I, I had to reprogram my brain was like, oh, I, I'm wasting time just sitting here crocheting. But at this point, crocheting is one of my biggest hustles in terms of money, you know, so now it's funny because like I'll spend half a day crocheting and then I'll start to feel bad about it. And then I'll remember, oh, wait, I'm getting paid for this project. This is great. <laughs> so like it's it's 
the pro the process of getting through the murder and it's also like I talk a lot about starting my business so it's about how to become an agorist I have two chapters about agorism in there and tips for starting a business as a crafter and basically the stuff that I learned while I was writing the book because I didn't have a crafting business when I started the book that that's what's also kind of cool so like <laughs> It was a lot of fun. It was, and it, it was kind of a life-changing thing. It was also a practice book because I planned to write a more in-depth like memoir of how I got into Mexico and my childhood and all of that stuff rolled into one. And that's like kind of a terrifying, daunting task. So this is my way of wrapping my head around the book writing process and book publishing process. You got your whole life to do a bigger one, you know? Um, exactly. Is this just... Is this just an ebook, or do you have a um, an actual paper version or anything in the works? For for now, it's it's only an ebook. It's a hundred and three page ebook. Um, I'm talking to both Dana Martin and Liberty Under Attack pub Publications about at least doing a small batch of printing because the way I made it is like it, it would be a cool book to have on your coffee table because it's colorful. You know, it makes you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. um and and the, and the title is really interesting too because it's stitching my life back together one woman's crafty journey after losing everything to a murder <laughs> so i kind of like vague vague booked it there but like it's helped because it has been selling you know and all of the response has been great everybody who's gotten a copy has been very happy with what they've seen awesome the cool thing about having like an ebook out there too is it's like it's just out there like forever now. So it's like, and it's also, you, just, you, you might get a couple bucks, you know, here and there, just like forever, you know, if it sells a million, exactly. awesome. If it sells a hundred, cool, you know? Yeah. And it, and it's, and it's like instant for the customer too. like the customer really likes that, you know, experience of buying it. Okay. And then they have the thing and then they're able to read it immediately. You know, like I had, I had like several people both posting about my book and messaging me about it the next morning. Like I already read it, you know, and that's, that's cool. Like that was a cool feeling. Yeah. It's really neat. Yeah. That's really cool. And for the, and for those of you guys who don't know, Agorist Nexus is doing publishing too. We're actually, actually going to publish Wendy McElroy's new book, hopefully this year, but, but, but maybe next year we'll just kind of we'll we'll see when she's done with it. So uh, no promises on the timeline, but th there's a promise that that uh, she'll be coming out with that. So yeah, man, Dana Martin, she's um she's kind of a an inspiration to me somewhat. Like um, I saw her speak at Anarcho Poco, and uh, and uh, she was um, she was amazing. So shout out to her and and if anybody doesn't know her she does like she does a lot of speaking on like peaceful parenting and all kinds of stuff i think i like emailed her one time like want, wanting to get her on here but yeah she's she's really cool yeah well what, was there anything else you wanted to talk about dag check my list here no man i th I, th I think we got everything is there anything else you want to talk about, Lily? No, other than, well, I will mention this. Anarchapulka this year is going to be badass. I did mention before the call I'm working for them. So technically this is a paid endorsement. <laughs> but I'm working for them because Anarchapulka this year is doing everything that we were basically like rallying for in the past. You know, like they're not quite as decentralized as we are, but I mean, one, one thing I kind of learned in the past is that, like, the world was not ready for the full structure of Anarchapulco, but they were ready for Anarchapulco to fucking decentralize and focus on agorism and the things that people care about, and that's what that's what's happening this year. You mentioned Kat, Kat Bonadine from the Homestead Guru. Well, currently, she's Kat Bonadine of Anarchapulco, and she's got who Jessica Kill, everybody hated her, although, like... She grew on me last year, oddly enough. Yeah, and I was heavily critical of her too. Um, but Kat is the perfect person for this job. She has completely like overhauled how they're doing things and making it so it's about community and you know promoting solutions and talking about the things that people really care about. And for the first time ever, there's going to be an agorism stage. I'm fucking stoked. 
Um, I'll be speaking on that. I'll be there in person. The virtual event's really cool too. Um, I know there's a lot of confusion because you can go in person to Acapulco for $1,000, but there's also a $150 ticket that gets you into in-person events, one of them being thrown by Float. Float is throwing Float Fest, which is official Anarchapulco party. And if you have an Anarchapulco virtual ticket, you get in a Float Fest, which is going to have more shit than Anarchapulco anyway, and it's an in-person event in Texas, I'm pretty sure in Austin. So... Like, I just, I love how they've decentralized things this year. They're doing it virtual and there's going to be a virtual marketplace and it's just going to be a very different, more, you know, more what it should have been in the first place kind of thing. And I think like when the world opens up again, like Anarchapulco is going to be ready. (laughs) I'm excited, like, for the first time in a long time. Like, even last year, I was, I was pretty nervous to go to Anarchapoco, but this year, like, it's so different. I'm so proud of them. <laughs> I actually do have one other thing that I wanted to say. Um, I uh, I do want to encourage any of y'all to um, get in contact with Lily if you want to have uh, any, like, crafts or anything made. Um, she has been clothing my family. She has mittened and hatted my wife and sweatered my dog. <laughs> and they are uh, yeah. they're really nice pieces so be sure to uh, be sure to check it out and um i uh one thing and if any of this is something she just went out there i'm sure editor can take it out but um the fact that i have been having handmade stuff um in mexico paid for with cryptocurrency smuggled into this country um and then uh and then being shipped to me is like the most agorous thing in the world and it feels so good to say <laughs> Yeah, so I've been having you, a lot of fun with that. I, I've been giving people the novelty value with that because I've also like I've been giving crypto consulting for money, but I've also been doing free consulting for my customers. So I'm like, look, if you want to learn how to use Bitcoin, I'll teach you how so you can pay me. And more than half of them take me up on it and give it a go. And it's it's really cool, you know, and it's also like. It's cool that so many people are participating because I have, you know, I have middlemen. So I have people that I ship to and they they go and they cross the border and they smuggle it for me. And then they go and they ship it out like it's a big thing, but it's just crafts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. And I don't That's know if so I cool. that. Yeah, paid for with cryptocurrency. You know, it's like the whole yep. thing is just so like beautiful, you know. It's a beautiful Drug and aggressive. Refugee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just every aspect yeah it's it's honestly like and and i i was joking with my dad a couple days ago because my my dad used to give me shit for how much time i'd sit there on my computer and stuff he's like you're never gonna make money just sitting on your computer watching tv but like that's what i do now (laughs) like a lot of the times when i'm making those crafts i'm just sitting there watching netflix on my computer crocheting and it's just like i'm getting i'm not only getting paid but i'm getting paid good money that goes up in value just by me sitting on it (laughs) yeah right yeah i think i think like maybe maybe people don't understand this feeling yet like once you once you buy something like tax-free or you're like you're purchasing something from like an like like an uh, uh, you know somebody you know who's an agorist and it's like something that they've made i don't know about other people but like me personally i just feel so much better about it like that's that's one of my favorite things like to do that's one of my things i love about mexico in the city i live in for example there's this cactus store run out of this guy's house and he has like so many exotic varieties that i drool and freak out over and it's just run out of his house and I love going there and supporting him because of that. Um, like another example I have is my friend Shona Rudner, I think is how her name is um, spelled on Facebook. But she's just always been super nice and supportive to me. I'm pretty sure she even donated to me after the murder. But she started finally after years of posting about it, she started her craft business, pouring resin and selling resin items. And she finally came up with something that I liked, which was a a Ouija board rolling tray. And I bought two of them and had them shipped. And I just got them this week. And like, it was a source of pride because I was her first Bitcoin transaction ever. She's an agorist craft artist, you know, and now I have like, I'm looking at it right now. I have like this, you know, it kind of looks like fake amethyst, but a Ouija board. 
And it's just, it's pleasing, you know, like all these little things I pick up from these agorists make me happy. <laughs> so support the counter economy people. Right. Oh yeah. Well, but, I think we're going to wrap it up there. If you guys, if you guys are good. I don't have a quote, so we might have to, <laughs> we might have to edit this out till I find one. Yeah. Um, do you have a quote, Dag? I, 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 I got so caught up with yesterday. Them. If we want to keep doing, um, dude, I just feel like we can just do quotes of like the most dangerous superstition paragraph. I know that. you could just do it like line by line. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the the one you had yesterday was yesterday, really good. Like yeah, yeah. We'll yeah, do that. My one. fucking favorite. Okay, yeah, do that one. Where it's like flip sideways on me. The great Larkin Rose. So. <clears throat> All right, so quote this week is going to be from uh, Larkin Rose's book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, which, of course, I highly recommend if any of you guys haven't read it. <clears throat> the truth is one who seeks to achieve freedom by petitioning those in power to give it to him has already failed, regardless of the response. To beg for the blessing of authority is to accept that the choice is the master's alone to make, which means that the person is already, by definition, a slave. Larkin Rose. Gorgeous Nexus out. That's deep. A gorst, a gorst next to that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh man, he already said a gorst next to that. 